Welcome, everybody. Uh, we have Roberto Calandra with us today. I'm very excited to hear about his research. He is, uh, to me, well, most well known as a, a researcher in model based reinforcement learning. Uh, while I was a part of model based reinforcement learning team, uh, we read quite a few of his papers and uh, actually implemented some of his, uh, his uh, algorithms in our development toolbox that is now open sourced. Um, he is a research scientist at Facebook AI Research, and uh, he is also one of the main contrib contributors, as far as I understand, to uh, Facebook AI's uh, model-based reinforcement learning uh, toolbox that was also recently open sourced. Um, before that, he was a postdoctoral scholar uh, at the uh, uh, Berkeley, uh, working with Sergei Levine. Uh, and even before that, uh, he uh, did his PhD in Germany at Darmstadt, with, uh, where he was supervised by Jan Peters and Mark Deisenroth, that uh, we all know here. Um, he comes from Italy, uh, where he did his uh, uh, bachelor degree in computer science. Um, he uh, is most, uh, uh, mostly working on uh, robotics problems, but uh, what is important for us as well, he has done quite a bit of uh, work on Bayesian optimization as well. Right, so today he's gonna talk about uh, Bayesian optimization for robotics. Uh, I'm very excited to hear about uh, his work. Um, Roberto, please, uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, nice to virtually meet uh, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure, um, yeah meeting you and giving a talk. Um, although uh, I, I must uh, you know, public say that Bayesian optimization would have not been the main topic of a talk if I had uh, sort of more choice. Uh, in this moment, I, I, I work mostly on other topics. So some of the content you will see is a little bit uh, outdated, uh, but I hope that you will still be able to find some interesting bit and pieces uh, throughout this journey over many works that I've been doing in the field. And the overall, and the topic will be, yeah, Bayesian optimization for robotics. Um, so the goal of the talk um, is going to be maybe a bit different compared to many standard um, talks that uh, you know you might have from, from researchers in the field, in the sense that I will try uh, in the first place, to explain some of the challenges of, of robotics, I'll try to give a very um, sort of hands-on practical view of what are the, the issues, challenges, and, um, and also sort of application or settings that you might encounter in real life when, when applying Bayesian optimization. Um, I will then present several uh, applications that we, we had of Bayesian optimization in, in the robotics fields uh, that were all successful. Um, and finally, I will try to argue a little bit uh, why Bayesian optimization is sort of a powerful tool um, that every, every person working on robotics should actually uh, use and be aware of. And in order to start, um, and you know, if at any time you have questions sort of throughout the talk, please feel free to interrupt. Uh, and uh, I'll try to keep anyway uh, pace so that I can go through all of the slides. So um, to give, starting from robotics, I would like to give you an idea of what is the state of the art in robotics nowadays. This is a video from uh, the DARPA challenge in 2015. And these were essentially some of the best team in the world doing robotics with you know, teams of 50 to 100 people working for several years, spending many, uh, million dollars on, on developing, you know, in some case, the hardware, but certainly the control software. And what you can see as a human is that these robots are failing miserably and are failing in ways that are uh, embarrassing in the sense that these are not the kind of failures that we would expect uh, robots or any type of intelligent system to, to actually do in the real world. If you take a uh, my son, four years old, you know, he's never going to fail like this by grasping an object in the void and then falling over. So 
the underlying things that I want you to, to get is that the way that we do robotics nowadays in the, in the traditional sense is uh, to a large extent flawed. And learning is, uh, is in my opinion, a really important um, component on how to, to fix this. So why learning? Um, the problem at the moment is that robotics still heavily rely on human uh, expertise. Um, if we would be taking most of the controllers that we have seen applied to these robots, they were typically uh, hand designed by, by you know, a plethora of engineers that would spend months to, to, to design and to tune the individual controllers for individual tasks. Uh, however, this is not very really scalable uh, because it's extremely time consuming um, and you, know, you need extremely large teams. And even then, in the moment when you want to actually test this, uh, um, this, this uh, uh, sort of controllers and robots in the real world, this is typically very expensive time-wise, even, even maintenance-wise. And the results are often stochastic. So there is no real guarantee that if you repeat the same experiment twice, you will get the same outcome. In, in the robotic world, there is this joke that, you know, if something works, you should take a video because it's never going to work again. So um, it's sort of important to understand that these are real limitations of the way that we do engineering in robotics nowadays. And, uh, and, and in, on top of this, there, are, um, there is the traditional engineers that look at the at sort of people that do learning. And what he really sees is the fact that, oh, we are doing black box things that we don't really understand and we don't really know know what's happening and we cannot guarantee what's going to happen and um, we don't really know why the decision making is is you know doing something uh, specifically and um, in my experience with a lot of engineers there is also uh, some um, some tip of human presumption uh, where you, you know if you say oh I think I can learn a controller better than this you know the engineer would be super pissed off and say no no I you know I have 20 years of experience in this field. I know what's best. I know how to design this best, um, which it's not always the case. So um, just so that we are all on the same page, um, the sort of mathematical framework that I'll be using uh, in this talk is sort of the traditional black box optimization. Uh, you should all be uh, super familiar with this, but just, just uh, to synchronize on the, on the terminology, um, we essentially have an objective function uh, f, and uh, this objective function typically has some parameters that we want to, uh, to optimize. And we're going, in many cases, to minimize or maximize, depending on what's the task, uh, these parameters in order to obtain a sort of optimized set of parameters that really, uh, that ideally is the sort of global minimum or global maximum of the objective function. And the way that Bayesian optimization is typically applied in robotics is by considering a sort of policy search setting where you assume that you have a, a, a policy or a controller pi, which is the controller that will be running on your robot. And this policy will typically take the current state of the robot, which can be uh, encoders from your joints, can be uh, camera inputs, whatever other sensor input that you can measure. Uh, and then this policy will be parameterized uh, in some way. And uh, in the moment, at every instant in time, sort of time is discretized. And at every instant in time, if you would be applying this policy, we will have a, a set of actions uh, that we uh, actually can uh, execute onto you know, controlling the, the motors uh, of, uh, of our robot. And uh, what typically means to do uh, to use Bayesian optimization to do policy search in this context is that uh, what we want to do is that we want to find the optimal uh, parameters of this policy, uh, typically by maximizing a reward or minimizing a cost. And this problem um, is in, in many cases, in most uh, real world cases, is a zero order uh, optimization problem, which is stochastic and which is uh, expensive to evaluate because evaluating this function means that you actually need to you know, set up your robot, you need to execute uh, an experiment and you need to measure uh, what's the outcome of the experiment. And um, in the, 
uh, almost a decade ago. Now they, uh, I, I was a fresh PhD student uh, that just joined uh, to Darmstadt, and uh, and and you know, I was working with Mark Dyson wrote very strictly, and at some point we stumbled upon one one of the first projects that I really did was uh, this project which was very interesting, where we essentially stumbled upon a bipedal uh, robot called Fox, uh, which was uh, owned by uh, Andre Seifert from the biomechanical uh, department in Darmstadt. And this robot was very interesting from a control perspective because it was a quasi-passive dynamic walker, which are robots that can in theory walk extremely fast, um, but they, they are also are impossible to model. Uh, because they are undersensed and, and they have a lot of uh, um, difficulties in modeling springs and other, and other things. So uh, we essentially had this robot and, uh, and the people from biomechanical engineer uh, had, uh, had defined a uh, finite state machine controller, which had kind of eight parameters uh, that were interesting, that were roughly and telling about the angle of attack of the feet with respect to the ground and some of the uh, some of the essentially conditions to switch from one state to the other. And at the time there was a PhD student that essentially had spent two years uh, designing this controller and then tuning it by, uh, by trying to replicate the sort of the behavior of humans uh, and, and you know, finding the, the corresponding parameters. Uh, however, this robot had a really a sort of large drawback, which was that the motors of this robot would break very often. Uh, the average motor was had about 200 trials of lifetime uh, because, because of the extremely high forces that were uh, happening every time the robot was falling would eff effectively destroy the gearbox uh, of these cheap motors very fast. So the one problem that we had is, you know, how do we actually have this robot working within 200 evaluations uh, in a way that is satisfactory so that we can collect data of, of, you know, of walking gates. And of course, the answer was uh, Bayesian optimization. So we essentially, um, after a, a shit ton of engineering, we essentially apply Bayesian optimization and the results were surprisingly uh, effective. Uh, I was not expecting this at the time, but effectively we were able to, to start from a controller that would fall down after a single step. And uh, within a few tens of, of trials, the robot could learn how to kind of walk, to take a few steps and then fall down. And after 80 trials, um, the robot was pretty much done with optimization and uh, was capable of walking very, very close to the theoretical speed of this robot. Uh, which was 0 0.45 meters per second, which is remarkably fast uh, considering that the system is 20 centimeters of height, and uh, and it was incredibly stable. Um, just to give a comparison, we got performance that were equivalent or, or slightly superior to what this PhD student spent two years, uh, you know, sort of tuning the parameters for. Uh, but we obtained these results by running Bayesian optimization for less than a day, uh, including all the all the maintenance and sort of you know um, human human breaks. Uh, and in this particular case, you can even see that it recovers uh, when, it's, when it's falling down. And this was kind of eye-opening for me because it, it really showed, okay, these algorithms actually work. It works in the real world. It works with a, with a particularly nasty and challenging system, uh, which has um, you know, very strange condition. Noise is not Gaussian. Uh, it has a bunch of difficult things in here. And if we were looking at the learning curve, um, this is the the learning curve that we got, which is what in practice I've kept seeing for most of the real world system in my life after, which is that in the beginning, the system doesn't really know what's happening. So the model is sort of overestimating what are the performance of the, um, of the system. But ultimately when we collect enough data, uh, you know, the system starts uh, sometimes getting the right, you know, the right prediction. And at some point it just click and the model sort of know exactly what's happening and we can actually predict well uh, sort of what's going on. And at the time we also did a comparison which for, for nowadays standards, I'm, I'm kind of ashamed because we run different acquisition function a single time uh, to compare them uh, because it was a mechanical system. So it was, you know, even just running these things took, took, took a week um, and, and it was you know, very painful, but 
we essentially just compared the fee acquisition function and we saw that uh, for this particular system, empirical GPUCB actually seemed to be working uh, quite nicely. However, another thing that was very interesting was that uh, after we collected all of this data, or we trained you know, the model in the optimization, we actually had the model. And so we spent a fair amount of time analyzing what the model learned and looking really into you know, what's happening, what's the belief of, the, of our Gaussian processes. And one of the very interesting things that we observed was that um, the model uh, between, the, uh, between the right hip and the left hip uh, was shifted by about five degrees. It was not symmetrical. The, the optimal performance for, for the left hip were you know, five, five degrees shifted. And this was very puzzling in the beginning. I was really like, you know, what's happening? Why is the model you know, wrong? And thinking about it more, um, it actually made a lot of sense because the robot was working in circle, uh, which means that the arc uh, from, the, from the inner legs is actually shorter than the arc from the, from the outer leg. And, and this is something that from, a, from a, a sort of user points of view, from a robotic points of view, is extremely powerful because it really allows you to gain insight into the, into the properties of your system, into the parameters uh, space that you have. Um, for things that are not, no, not necessarily intuitive, is something that I would have certainly not thought about designing, but the algorithms was powerful enough that could actually learn these things. And I think that this is super cool. And uh, um, I very strongly recommend people that use special optimization always to look into your model, look into your belief, see what's happening, because you, you never know, what's, what, you know what the system is actually learning that you might uh, be ignoring. Um, after this work, uh, this was you know, standard single objective optimization. And uh, after that, we essentially started looking at a number of problems that were beyond single objective optimization. In particular, at the time uh, when we were collecting this data, we saw that there was a very clear trade-off between walking speed of the robot and energy uh, consumption. Uh, because sort of, you know, the faster you want to go with a walking robot, the more energy uh, you need to put into the system. And this created a very interesting line of, of research and thoughts of, you know, how, um, how can we do multi-objective Bayesian optimization? And uh, from my perspective, a lot of the real problems that as engineers we deal with uh, every day are truly, really multi-objective optimization problems. It's just that for many uh, for many cases, it's easier to ignore uh, sort of this and just assume that they are single objective. But um, the way that typically multi-objective optimization uh, sort of uh, problems are formulated are by assuming that uh, a single set of parameters will have multiple metrics. And uh, uh, typically these metrics are, are in contrast with each other. So if you want to optimize, for example, walking speed, you will have to you know, uh, have uh, worse performance from an energetic point of view. And typically uh, doing multi-objective optimization means that what you want to do is that we want to find the Pareto front, which is the optimal set of, uh, of points, uh, uh, of, of dominant points, where essentially if you want to improve the performance of, of one of the functions, you need to lose uh, you know, some performance in a different function. And ideally, we would like to be able to find Pareto fronts that are uh, as complete as possible, as dense as possible, and of course, as accurate as possible. Um, however, this can be tricky if you just do uh, what most people in, in multi-objective optimization do, which is to uh, uh, essentially just look at the data that you collected in order to estimate what is the Pareto front. And one of the lines of research that we did at the time was to uh, try to predict what is the Pareto front uh, from data. This is, uh, of course, extremely logical and intuitive for anybody that does Bayesian optimization, but it's not so obvious in the context of multi-objective optimization. And what we saw at the time was that we, uh, uh, if we would just compute the traditional Pareto front from 20 evaluation, uh, this was actually very far from the true Pareto front. But if we would use the same amount of data to instead uh, you know, train a model and use this model to uh, estimate the Pareto front, uh, this was much closer already to, uh, to the ground truth. And already with 50 evaluation, um, the Pareto front uh, from the model was pretty much perfect, uh, spot on. 
And um, if we if we want to quantify this, we would on 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 two um, you know benchmark functions like the MOP two and the ZDT three, we would see that typically um, the the model uh, estimating the Pareto front from the from the model was several order of magnitude faster and more accurate uh, than than only using the data that we have. And this also allowed to have Pareto fronts which are denser, that are more accurate, and that ultimately give more choice to the end user to decide, uh, you know, finally what are the performance that they desire. Um, another advantage of, of, uh, of modeling the Pareto front is that we are also uh, resilient to noise. So if we have stochastic functions, uh, uh, what, what the tra traditional Pareto front um, uh, sort of estimation from data would do would, would be that uh, it would overestimate the performance uh, of, uh, uh, of some particular set of parameters just because out of luck, you know, we were lucky that uh, that was a particular good run. However, again, if we use models, we can essentially um, estimate what's the noise and we can ac more accurately predict what is the real Pareto front and, and also what would be the distribution uh, um, sort of around it. Um, and um, sort of, again, if we want to quantify, we can see that uh, the evaluation would ultimately overestimate um, the Pareto front, the goodness of the Pareto front. Um, another thing that was very interesting in the context of robotics and specifically of, uh, of Fox uh, was sensitivity analysis. Sorry, you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, I had a question on the Pareto front you estimate from the data. Uh, yeah. How do you collect the data? Is it a design of experiment? Is it random points? Or is it something that is obtained sequentially? Um, for this particular experiment, I believe it was random data. Um, I, I would expect that the results would, uh, uh, especially for this, for the under, uh, overestimation, I would expect this to be um, independent from, from the sampling technique. OK, thanks. Um, another thing that was very interesting for real world applications of robotics is sensitivity analysis. Uh, we, we always know that, um, you know, if we have stochastic functions, like in the real world, we typically have noise that is going to change the um, sort of the performance. And from a robustness point of view, from an engineering point of view, we would typically tend to prefer points that uh, have less variance uh, compared to points that have higher variance even if, we, if they have the same average performance. But even more importantly than this, uh, if we work in the real world, we often have um, systems where we are not able to set uh, a particular variable accurately to the desired uh, value, but we will have some uncertainty over the exact parameters that we are sampling. So for example, if I, you know, if I go to a workshop and say, hey, I would like you to build me a spring uh, that is five newtons, um, chances are that they will have some, some tolerance margin and they will be able to produce me one that is 4.99 or 5.01, but not necessarily exactly 5.0000. Uh, you know, and this is extremely important if we, if we consider um, you know, this type of problems in the real world, uh, because sometimes uh, there, there might be landscape uh, where even small perturbations of the parameter will actually yield to much larger uh, decrease in performance. And instead, what we really would like to have is to have sort of plateaus where um, even if we perturb the parameter, um, the performance stay uh, more or less constant or you know, sort of is, is robust. So one advantage of using Bayesian optimization techniques in multi-objective optimization is that we can actually um, also evaluate uh, the sensitivities of our functions. And uh, for example, this is a you know, MOP2 function traditional benchmark. We can see how uh, different areas uh, of the Pareto fronts might have different, different robustness. And of course, having uh, points that are robust uh, might actually be desirable compared to, to the, uh, sort of choosing points that are uh, not robust. This is even more visible, for example, in the uh, RMTP3 function, where the primary Pareto front is, is very unstable. So very small perturbations of the, uh, of the parameters will actually yield to, to very bad performance. 
while there is then a secondary uh, Pareto front, which is this, this yellow red one, uh, which is much more stable. And from an engineering perspective, we, we should actually honestly um, consider whether, whether we, we prefer to have, you know, maybe a slightly um, better performance uh, sort of uh, without noise versus um, having more robustness uh, in the real world. Um, um, after this uh, excursion in, uh, in sensitivity analysis, um, I was extremely lucky to meet with Chris Pister um, in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Berkeley. And Chris had one of the most interesting system I've ever worked with, which is this uh, uh, micro robot exapod that they, they produce in, in their lab, which is uh, a completely crazy system because it's, it's extremely small. It's extremely difficult to, uh, to control, even to design. And you know, he essentially told me, hey, we have this system. We don't know how to control it. We don't know how to have it working. Uh, you know, what can we do with learning? And this was a really interesting problem. So what we did at the time was that we set up a simulator to start studying um, sort of the, the gates of this robot. And uh, in particular, this robot has six, uh, uh, six legs and each leg has two motors. Uh, so that you can essentially create a, a limited cycle where the legs first go up, then move forward and go down and sort of repeat. And uh, one problem with micro robots is that there are no very good physical models at that scale. Uh, so we just approximated the dynamics with the, with the micro scale robot. And we decided to use central pattern generators, which is a common control um, sort of scheme uh, for locomotion. And at that point, we started applying all the Bayesian optimization tools we had. So um, we designed initially four CPG controllers that encode a sort of standard gates that we observe in nature, like tripod, ripple, wave, for two, uh, which are you know, gates that we observe, especially in animals. And at first, we just you know, did standard single objective optimization. We saw that uh, uh, the ripple and uh, uh, and wave uh, were a little bit better than the others. Uh, but even if we look, for example, at dual tripod, you know, this guy is able to, to walk fairly well. And it takes only about 40 trials to learn how to walk, uh, which is great. It's promising. It's likely that we can actually learn these things on a physical robot. Um, then we looked at the multi-objective case by using, uh, in this particular case, we use Parigo from, from Joshua Knowles. Uh, very, very nice algorithms, very easy to implement for multi-objective Bayesian optimization. And uh, here things started to get interesting uh, because if we would actually compare these different gates, we would see how dual tripod would uh, clearly win in terms of, of Trados performance because had the best, best speed with the least amount of, of energy um, until reaching about 0.6 centimeters per second at which point um, the ripple would instead become the uh, sort of uh, the more uh, appropriate gate. And this is interesting because it's sort of uh, remind very loosely to, to what we observe also in nature where animals uh, essentially transition from gates, uh, from, from walking to running and so, and so on, uh, based essentially on, 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 on a lot of uh, energy efficient, uh, on concerns about speed and energy efficiency. And even more interesting was that um, we uh, try to have uh, gates that don't, we essentially open up more parameters of the CPG generators, and we essentially try to optimize again this function by uh, discovering gates that don't exist in nature. And we were actually able to do so by, by having gates that were almost twice as fast, uh, but uh, at an even higher uh, energy cost. And here you can see this guy, uh, one of these gates, which is very funny because it seems like, you know, some of the legs are not really doing much, the one in the middle and the other one are taking like very tiny, small steps. Um, but performance wise, you know, it's, it's actually doing great. It's opening a, a, a entirely new, new sort of performance space. Um, another um, sort of interesting case that it has practical usefulness is contextual Bayesian optimization, where not all of the parameters are controllable, but we also have some variables uh, C, which are uh, the context. And this context is, 
is observable but not controllable typically. And um, um, a sort of um, a case that we, we studied at the time was, uh, you know, what if we have the robot learning to walk uh, over different uh, uh, inclinations? And in practice, we saw that we could uh, sort of learn uh, just with, uh, uh, with a few, uh, uh, with three inclinations. And then we were able fairly well to uh, essentially um, interpolate and extrapolate uh, the model uh, to performance, to inclinations that we have never seen before. And this is very cool. It's also very useful in practice. And uh, we also um, extended this to uh, trying to learn locomotion primitives, where we would essentially, uh, at running time, set different goals for the robot to try to reach. Let's say, turn left, go straight, turn right. And then we would convert this into a multi-objective optimization a model that we could then use uh, in order to do planning um, in, in real time later on. And in practice, uh, by, by just learning these primitives and then combining them for planning, we were able to uh, navigate fairly complex um, sort of um, you know, maps and topologies um, with less than 50, I think it was 50 trials overall for, for just learning these primitives and then combining them. Um, which is very, um, again, from a data efficiency point of view, I think this is very cool and great if we want to apply this to a real uh, robot. Um, following this, we moved on to more expensive optimizations. And um, the, the sort of thing here was that um, in robotics, there is typically a tight relationship between the morphology of the robot that you have and the controller that you're going to apply uh, on it. But designing the morphology of the robot can be very complex and extremely time consuming. And uh, in the case of, uh, of Chris, um, he essentially came to me at some point say, Robert, we have no idea how to design the legs of these robots. We, we don't know how, you know, what's the best shape of the legs. And I was like, no, Let's try to apply Bayesian optimization on this. Uh, you know, maybe we can automate it. And um, um, the catch here is that we essentially, um, if we want to jointly optimize hardware and software, we would essentially have two separate lines of optimization. One line of optimization, uh, which is sort of the software, which is relatively inexpensive to evaluate. You know. Um, a person can, can sort of learn how to do something relatively fast. But if we look instead at the other axis, which is the hardware, uh, changing the hardware of a population uh, actually can take you know, millions of years uh, because you need to have this slow evolutionary process. And if we want to change a hardware of a robot, this is going to be extremely expensive because it will mean that we need to um, essentially uh, design and manufacture new parts and assemble this. So there is going to be a much higher cost in changing the, the morphology of a robot compared to changing the associated cost of, uh, of changing the controller. So we essentially formulated this as a um, sort of hierarchical uh, problem where um, effectively the manufacturing of, of a single robot of a of a batch of robots would take about one month of in real time because it needs to be um, microfabricated in Taiwan, then shipped over, this is, you know, mounted and so on. However, once we would have a single morphology, um, running, optimizing the software was actually something that we could do in a day or so. So the idea was that we wanted really to, uh, to have two sort of loops, uh, one loop where we would, which would be an outer loop which was very expensive to, to run, which was optimizing the morphology. And then an inner loop that once we have a morphology, we want to be able to learn how to work with this. And the inner loop is, is less expensive to run. And um, moreover, for our particular problem, we are able to, uh, to fabricate robots in batch uh, up to uh, five because they, uh, the technologies for fabricating them uh, allow to do this. Um, so, in order to solve this problem, we design a new algorithms, which we call hierarchical process constraint batch batch optimization, um, which actually worked very well for our problem. And the results was that um, if we compare our algorithms compared to standard batch optimization, 
just in terms of controller evaluation, standard version optimization will be better because at every trial, standard version optimization will change both morphology and controller, and we'll be able to sample the space more efficiently. However, if we look at the, in terms of morphology iterations, um, our algorithm is significantly uh, more efficient compared to standard BO, because once we essentially uh, fix a particular morphology, we are going to explore the whole slice um, uh, sort of more thoroughly, and then we can exploit uh, the structure better. And if we also include then the fabrication cycles with the batch, this is sort of even better. And in practice, at the end, we got uh, four different morphologies, which were working very well. And quite interesting, uh, we saw how um, the controller of each one of these morphology was actually very um, specific to the, to the particular morphology. So if we would change the controller from a morphology to the other, um, things would not work. We would have several severe uh, decreases in, in performance. Um, at the same time, some of these morphologies and gates uh, were also quite uh, close to what we, observe, we would observe in, in nature, uh, in, in some insects in particular, with, uh, you know, with a lot of these gates where the front legs are, uh, are sort of um, pushing the robot to be more inclined um, for, for better grip. Um, I will now do a brief interlude on using version optimization for model-based reinforcement learning which is something that um, I'm, I'm actually very interesting, uh, interested about. And this, this is sort of a fun thing. Uh, before I start these questions. No questions? OK. Then I will continue. Again, please feel free to interrupt at any time. Um, so model-based reinforcement learning typically works by having a uh, um, by learning a dynamic system, uh, forward dynamic of the of our robot or system, which is from state we're going to end action, we're going to predict next state, and once we have these dynamics, we then plug it in together with a reward function in order to do planning or some optimization of the controller. We go out in the real world, we apply this to our robot and sort of collect more data, and. Uh, after we collect more data, we take, you know, we add the tuples of state and actions that we observed to our data set, and we sort of, you know, restart the loop by learning a more accurate dynamics model. Um, however, there is something strange in this loop. Um, there is something that is kind of illogical. Um, does anybody want to, to get a, um, a shot at uh, sharing what is the problem? Anybody, wild guesses? There's a real of the space where you're not sure about the dynamics. Is it? Yeah, uh, that's certainly, uh, um, uh, that can be a practical problem. Um, I would say that this is not necessarily a fundamental flaw of this flow sort of of this diagram but it in practice yeah it can be a pretty big issue any other guess so something that is very illogical about this loop is that um, in reinforcement learning what we care about is reward and we are in this loop we are measuring reward and we are throwing it away the single bit of information that we care about we're not using it. We're literally throwing it away. And you know, why do we even care about this? Why do we even collect this if we don't use it? So um, one of the questions that we, we started asking a few years ago is, uh, you know, what are the alternative to throwing away this reward function? Can we incorporate this somehow in, and make use of this information uh, in, in the traditional model-based RL framework? And the answer is that we, we can, and in particular, we looked at how to incorporate the reward in the face of learning dynamics, uh, forward dynamics models. And we looked uh, in particular on 
uh, whether it's possible to optimize the forward dynamics model, not with respect to the negative log likelihood of your data, which is the traditional way to, uh, to, to learn the dynamics model, but directly optimizing with respect to the reward. Now, this is traditionally um, intractable in an analytic way because you cannot always backpropagate through the planning uh, algorithms. Uh, however, um, you can use zero order optimizers like Bayesian optimization, and this is exactly what we did. We would essentially optimize the, the dynamics model of the system uh, with respect to the, to the expected reward of, of using the dynamic system in the world. Now, this is relatively controversial, and I'll get back to this in a second. But in, in the real world, this actually worked extremely well. We applied this to a quadcopter, and we were able to get performances that were about 10% better than the nominal controller of the, of the quadcopter that uh, you know, was probably um, done by spending several uh, months, hundreds of hours of engineering of somebody uh, to actually design uh, the nominal controller. And what was interesting was that um, by doing this, we would typically learn dynamics, func uh, sort of forward dynamics that were uh, physically uh, not, not necessarily even real, not, not even really uh, feasible, uh, but were performance wise extremely close to the optimal performance. In many cases, we were within 5% of the optimal performance, even if the, if the physical uh, the uh, dynamics that we were learning didn't have a physical representation or didn't really match the real representation, the, the real dynamics of the system. Roberto? Yeah. I, I have one uh, question. You say you optimize with respect to the reward, but it's still a function that predicts the dynamic, right? So is it just you want to be accurate in the region of high reward? Yes, exactly. Yes, this is excellent, excellent intuition. Yes, what we believe it's happening here is that the, um, it's essentially that the, um, the system is learning uh, useful dynamics, which are accurate along the optimal trajectory. So for example, what, what from a control perspective we could hypothesize is that maybe we are learning a linearization of the, of the uh, dynamics along the optimal trajectory. Uh, but this doesn't this effectively reflect into having dynamic systems that don't necessarily extrapolate and don't, not, don't necessarily make sense from a traditional system identification uh, sort of points of view. And really, the main drawback here is that once we learn these models, they don't really seem to generalize new, well to new tasks in the way that a more general purpose uh, dynamic system, a dynamic model would would do. However, they were in practice useful and they were able to, um, to give us high performance. So um, in, in our general line of research about model base RL, um, this is a proof that accurate models, uh, a dynamics model are actually not a necessary conditions for, for good perf control performance. And this also fits very well with some subsequent research that we did, where we showed that accurate dynamics model are not a condition, sufficient condition uh, for good control performance, um, which um, opened really interesting um, sort of um, lines of research for the future. Uh, I will not talk more about this because of time uh, constraints. Um, but uh, finally, uh, before concluding, I wanted to talk about a final piece of work, uh, which is very close to my heart because uh, has been something we've been, uh, I've personally been working for, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years before it actually saw the light of publications. And this is uh, um, high dimensional version optimization with linear embeddings. Um, in 2016, well, it was actually earlier. There were drafts of this, I think, around 2013 or 14. But there is this excellent work from uh, Wang uh, and, and other folks where they essentially proposed to do Bayesian optimization uh, using linear, random linear embeddings. Um, and this work, uh, when I saw it at the time, um, I thought it was a really neat idea. I thought it was really cool. And it also addressed one of the main limitations uh, that I really see in Bayesian optimization, which is the scalability to higher dimensional spaces. And I was super excited about this paper. However, already in 
you know, when it came out, um, we started working with, with a bunch of students in, in Darmstadt, and we started noticing that there were a few fundamental um, flaws in the algorithms that is presented in the paper. And um, um, I remember in the conference line, line eight in, uh, in Florida, we were already discussing about these things kind of openly with other researchers, uh, including Benoit, uh, Michael Benoit, that then did a, a very good paper explaining what are some of the issues with this. And effectively, there are several wrong assumptions that are, uh, are sort of uh, throughout the paper, present throughout the papers, uh, which severely uh, limit the um, sort of the performance of this type of algorithms in the real world. And I will now sort of briefly try to explain, oh, oops, uh, what are some of the issues. Um, so uh, effectively, you know, in 2019, uh, after I moved to Facebook, I was extremely lucky to meet uh, Ben Latham. And uh, uh, together with him, he was really, you know, the lead in, uh, uh, in taking back these ideas that we had and these problems that we observed and develop them into a coherent theory, a coherent paper. And some of the things that we discovered that are really interesting is that linear projections um, in this uh, lower dimensional space don't really preserve product kernels, uh, which is a big issue because you cannot use uh, traditional ARD kernels uh, in uh, uh, essentially when you do these embeddings, but uh, you, you would get much better results if you instead use a Malanobis kernel. Um, a second point, which is important, is that most of the points in the bedding map uh, essentially get projected to the boundaries of the, um, um, of, of the projection. And, uh, and, and this is a really big problem because it means that you get a lot of points that are invalid. And once, uh, what, what Rambo does is that once you have this invalid point, then they get reprojected into a valid point. Uh, but you know, this point uh, is sort of not the same one that you originally wanted to, uh, to sample. Um, so what we do is that we, um, we also suggest in, in this paper uh, to constrain the bedding optimizations so that you can only select points that are within the bounds in the first place. Uh, and finally, um, the linear embedding, um, using linear embedding with the, with the sampling a technique of the projection matrix that is used in Rambo has a fairly low probability of containing the optimum in the first place, which means that you might be searching in a space which, uh, you know, where the optimum is already projected outside, and this kind of sucks. So what we suggest also in, in our algorithms is to instead use a unit hypersphere sampling for the projection for the linear projection matrix, and this will give you much better probabilities of containing the, the optimum. And in practice, we, uh, we propose these algorithms, which we call a label and, uh, or ALBO, depending who you ask. Uh, and uh, these algorithms uh, seems to be working extremely well compared to uh, higher high dimensional Bayesian optimization algorithms, uh, including Rambo, Hasbo, uh, and sort of um, even SMAC and CMA, yes, for, and Turbo uh, for some of these, uh, these problems. Uh, so we were extremely happy um, about this. Uh, we also observed that uh, there are still problems where these algorithms uh, sort of performs badly. Um, if, uh, you know, if the landscape is particularly jagged. Uh, in the paper, we have a, in particular one experiment for robot locomotion, where essentially we show how, uh, how you know, all Bayesian optimization algorithm sucks compared to CMA, yes. So, um, I do believe that there is still a lot of space for research for further improving uh, high dimensional Bayesian optimization algorithms. And I think this is a particularly important and relevant um, sort of line of research that we will need to tackle uh, more in the future. Um, all of this work that I presented today would have not been possible without a number of amazing collaborators. Unfortunately, I didn't have pictures of all of them. Here, there are just some of them. But you know, I'm extremely thankful to all of the collaborators that uh, um, sort of appear in all of the papers that I presented today, and I really feel uh, you know lucky of having worked with them. So to conclude and summarize, I I hope I gave you a little bit of an idea of some of the challenges of 
of Bayesian optimization applied to robotics. And uh, also I showed you some of the successful applications that we had in the past, including uh, you know, a lot of locomotion, I guess. Um, and I honestly believe that Bayesian optimization is an extremely powerful and important tool in the toolbox of any person working on robotics and sort of embodied AI. And in my experience, it's extremely robust as an algorithms. Um, you know, reinforcement learning algorithms all often have issues with uh, with stability, with convergence, with how uh, sort of how much you need to tune the upper parameters before you actually get performance. Bayesian optimization, in my experience, is very hard that it fail. I've never seen it failing critically. Now, it might not be performing super well, but it always does something meaningful and useful. And the nice plus is also that you get models out of this where you can really look at the insights that you gained. You can see at the belief that the model is learning. And this is extremely useful uh, from a debugging point of view, uh, again, compared to black box reinforcement learning algorithms where you don't really know what's happening and it's very hard to debug why something is failing. So thank you for your time and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thank you so much. Uh, right, I have a couple of questions, but uh, do we have some uh, someone else uh, already that, with some questions? I have one again. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I really like the first uh, video you showed with all the, the videos failing, the, all the robots uh, failing. That was, uh, that was great. Uh, the other types of video we can see of robots is the Boston Dynamic ones, where they do absolutely amazing things. Uh, there's, a, there's a world between these two things. Could you comment a bit on that? Yes. Um, so Boston Dynamics is an amazing company, and they do extremely impressive demos. Um, part of the reason why they're able to do this is that they have, um, you know, they had 15 years of experience to develop their own systems. They have, I, I don't know what's the size of nowadays, but, you know, I'm, I can bet that they have hundreds of engineers working on this. And to a large extent, the robots are not general purpose in the sense that they're programmed, you know, to do one thing. They're programmed to walk, they're programmed to run. Um, the problem is that Again, this is an issue of scalability, because if you if you want to have robots that are able to solve many different tasks, you cannot afford to spend millions of dollars, years of, of the research and development, and hundreds of engineers to solve and to, to design controllers to solve a single task. You need to be able to, um, you know, to, to do hundreds of tasks. You need to be able to uh, to do hundreds of tasks within a much shorter lifespan. Um, so this is the problem. And at the moment, Boston Dynamics uses no, no, no real learning. They do a little bit of perception from my understanding, but they don't really do learning. So um, I think that they will get there very soon, but uh, you know, we will see what comes out of that. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, one more question, if you don't mind, on, 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 on this first video. So you didn't really talk much about safety in robotics. Uh, like I understand there are some hard constraints as in like, don't bend this Lego, it will just break, right? So these are probably just encoded and forced based on your knowledge, but some software constraints, like don't lean too far, you'll fall. Mm -hmm. Do you learn them? Do you just like ignore them and let the algorithm do its thing? Or uh, do you code them again, hard code them? Like how do you deal with that in robotics normally? Um, there are two main ways of how to deal with um, constraint when you use spatial optimization, uh, sort of traditionally. Uh, the first one is to um, have additional terms in your objective function. Assuming that this is a single objective function, you know, you would just add some penalizing terms, for example, for uh, excessively high torques or for bending um, the joints close to, to, to the limits of the joints or you know, whatever else you consider as an unsafe behavior. 
Um, the other way that I've seen, and we've also used, although I, I, I don't talk about this in this talk, um, is to essentially uh, learn an additional sort of binary map uh, where you if, you, if you can just have binaries, oh, this was a sort of safe trial, or you know, this was a catastrophic failure, uh, you can essentially learn this binary uh, classifier in addition to your GP, and then you can use it for limiting uh, potential parameters that you're going to sample uh, so that you know, your optimizer uh, will be a constraint. When you, when you optimize the acquisition function, you effectively are doing a constraint optimization only to points that where the, this additional classifier says, yes, this is, this is safe. Okay, and well, is there any rule of thumb as to which to use when? Um, it depends. Um, um, it depends mostly whether the type of failures and safety constraints that you want to have are binaries or are somehow uh, metrics which are continuous. Uh, because if you uh, sort of if they are binary, you know, in some cases there are very obvious binary things. You know, did the robot fall down? Yes or no. Uh, you know, if the answer is yes, then you know, or no, then you should directly use uh, this uh, this masking. Um, if the metrics are more continuous, like oh, what is the amount of force that you're using? How close did you get to, you know, to the limit of falling down, for example? Uh, then you might uh, you might use these uh, uh, additional sort of penalizations in the objective function. But then the problem also becomes that it's often in practice difficult to um, to tune the reward function, uh, essentially by having a linear combinations of these parts, um, because it's, it's not clear what are the effects of different weights of the different terms of the reward function, um, which, which is a really big problem. This is the whole problem of essentially of scalarizing multi-objective functions into single objective, which is a really bad idea in, in general terms. All right, I think so. Yeah, thanks so much for the talk. You've, you've spoken mainly about using Bayesop to kind of fine tune like a handful of parameters that are parameterizing the controller. How hard is it to come up with like a controller that's good enough to then be fine tuned by the Bayesopt? Yes, this is a very good question. Um, in some cases, it can be extremely hard. Um, the good news is that at least in many robotic uh, tasks, we, we do typically have 40 years of, uh, you know, of people doing traditional control and robotics. So we do have many, in many cases, good general purpose um, control schemes that we know work well in practice. For one, one that I, I mentioned sort of in this talk is uh, central pattern generators. Now, if you want to do legged locomotion, uh, we know that central pattern generators work, um, you know, are, are extremely successful they can learn very stable uh, walking gates. Um, if we are talking about other types of, uh, uh, of task, um, you know, especially complex tasks, uh, that can of course be much harder to define uh, what a controller would look like. Um, so in my experience, in my experience, uh, using Bayesian optimization is mostly applicable when you already know that you have a parameterized, uh, a good parameterized uh, sort of controller. If you don't have this, uh, then my suggestion would be to go to model-based reinforcement learning. Thank you. Uh, another example are PID controllers. You know, if you want to use, uh, if you want to use a manipulator, PID controllers are something that everybody knows, everybody uses. Um, so I had a question regarding the linear embeddings. So first of all, I, I shared the same same feeling with linear embeddings that when I saw the paper first, was very excited. Then anyone I know that tried to use these found out it doesn't really work well, right? So great idea on the paper, billions of dimensions, but in practice it doesn't work with 10 dimensions. Uh, so what do you think is the current status with your paper? Do you think it's a go-to strategy now for 50, 100 dimensions? Or does it still, do you think we still need some breakthrough in, in this strategy before we can, we can use it confidently without nursing it too much? 
Um, this is a very good question. Um, so my my feeling about this is that uh, L LBO is essentially as as good as you can get by using linear embeddings, uh, which means that you need to have very strong, you know, the whole framework uh, to work well, you need to have very strong assumptions that the actual embedding is linear and that you sort of know what is the dimensionality or you reasonably know what is the dimensionality of the low dimensional embed, real low dimensional embedding. I think that if you, if these assumptions are reasonably um, fulfilled, LBO work extremely well and is very close to the best that we can get uh, like ever using linear embeddings. Um, my main issue with, uh, uh, with this whole sort of line of research is that in practice, it's very rare that embeddings are truly linear. Uh, and in my experience, most of the real robots embedding are actually nonlinear. And so the whole space of nonlinear embedding is still very much underexplored. So how do we actually scale high dimensional uh, Bayesian optimization to an arbitrary function? I think this is something that we have very little clue in this moment how to do. And I think it's the most interesting challenge in this moment in Bayesian optimization. I was, I was somewhat related to the question. So uh, when I did Bayesian reinforcement learning, which is a little while ago now, uh, I, I worked together with uh, people in the control group and in, in traditional control, people, people really strongly believe that you should put as much knowledge as you have about the dynamical system into your controller before you start. Right? And they were very unhappy that my controller worked pretty well and it didn't include any information whatsoever about the, the task. Right? So, so I wonder, and my view is sort of that the traditional control view, you, you try to put a lot of information in, but you also restrict the models to be things that are convenient to work with. And actually you shoot yourself so much in the foot by doing that, that, that in the end, you can sort of get away with, 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 with just doing these, these sort of very, very general notions. I wonder whether, whether you could say something to that. I mean, it seems to be a, a huge split in the community. Now I talk about the, the wider controller and machine learning community about how to attack these problems where, where people are sitting is essentially at the opposite ends of the spectrum. And, and I'm not moving very much. Um, I, I think that it's generally true that there are these two positions where uh, on one side sort of control people um, want to have clearly defined you know, models, assumptions, uh, control scheme. And that the fundamental problem there is that very often either the assumptions are not realistic or there are oversimplifications of, about the, the environments that you, uh, you're trying to, you know, or your system that you're trying to control. Um, assuming, for example, that everything is linear, you know, this is typically not true in the real world. Um, it's also true that in many cases, um, sort of in my experience, learning with deep reinforcement learning is more of a, it's more of a magic box, you know, it, it really depends from how many hundreds of hours the fish they spend on tuning the parameters and the upper parameters. And even then you don't really know why things work very often. It's just like, oh yeah, with this particular magic number, 3.22 of, you know, of learning rate, it works, everything else it doesn't. So what I've seen and what I think is the trend at the moment in, and already in the last few years is try a little bit to fill the gap in between by having learning systems that um, try to make use of, uh, of, of strong priors. Uh, so for example, if you're learning the dynamics model, uh, let's say you starting from a dynamics model that comes from first principles and then you know, learn the residual uh, on top of that. And um, I think that this is, a way, ultimately it's a way to essentially make a black box uh, sort of learning, which is currently a black box, a little bit more gray and, and really try to put stronger uh, inductive biases and priors. And I personally like this direction. I think that ultimately this is going to be successful. 
um, but it's not always obvious how to how to do this. So I found your gold drone dynamics learning via Bayesian optimization interesting. But, uh, would you think that you could apply, apply the same principle for Bayesian optimization algorithms themselves? Like there, you're also interested in uh, uh, having models that are actually skewed toward good representation, good accuracy in high rewarding regions and worse elsewhere, right? Yes. Um... Uh, I'll, I'll give you these thoughts, which I think it's interesting. So a uh, follow-up paper to that is the objective mismatch in model-based reinforcement learning. And in this paper that was published in 2020, we essentially show that learning a dynamics model with respect to the likelihood um, doesn't really guarantee that the control performance in a model-based array loops are, 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 are good. Uh, th there is very weak correlation between goodness of the dynamics model and, and actual performance. And the reason is because a lot of the uh, sort of the high level intuition is that it seems that the model is, a lot of the capacity of the model is used to learn things that might be relevant for the actual control task that you, the downstream task that you care about. And I sort of suspect that the same line of reasoning could also be applied to Bayesian optimization where you might not care about modeling the, uh, the functions everywhere accurately. You only care about modeling accurately in places where you, know, you have good performance. Um, and I suspect that there might be something, some interesting research to be done there. It's, it's also a little bit equivalent to asking, okay, why do we, when we learn a Gaussian process for Bayesian optimization, why do we do this with respect to the likelihood? Uh, yeah, exa exactly. <laughs> um, right. I think we are quite a bit of, uh, well, now we are all in the overtime. Um, are there any other pressing questions? No? I think perhaps then we can stop it here and thank Roberto for his uh, great talk. Thank you for Thanks having again. me. And uh, I hope to chat with many of you on, uh, on Monday. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.